I'm Harry Greenberger, president of the New Orleans Secular Humanist Association. Recently, our organization, along with the Unitarian Universalist Churches in New Orleans, sponsored a presentation by Reverend Roger Bruin. Reverend Bruin impersonated and appeared in the trademark rumpled suit and Borsalino hat of Clarence Darrow, who became famous supporting the right to teach evolution in the Scopes Monkey Trial of 1925. Following is his performance. I do want to thank you all for inviting me here to speak today. I uh, come with a little trepidation, both in terms of the subject matter, Mr. Darwin and his theories, uh, and in terms of this being so deep into the South, a region of the country that has not always been kind to me. You may be looking at me and thinking, you know, this is church and that man hasn't taken his hat off yet. Maybe you're thinking I want to be a hasty retreat if anything goes bad. Want to know where my hat is. Don't want to have to find it if I put it down someplace. They invited me here to talk about Mr. Darwin. What I know about natural selection would fit inside that hat and leave room still for my head. I confess to you freely that I've only read the first 50 pages of Origin of Species. That's also about how much of the Bible I have read and understood. Both books were slow going even for a city slicker like me. I got to that paragraph on page 50 where Darwin really starts to get into the heart of his theory and I thought, never going to understand this. So I started skipping around looking for the juicy parts. Trust me, there are no juicy parts in Mr. Darwin's writing. Uh, there is on page 267 a little reference to crosses and second crosses and cousins mating, and I thought, oh, this is going to get good, but it didn't. <laughs> Newspaper reporter asked me a couple of weeks ago, how can you defend Darwin's theories in the courtroom if you haven't read them? I love it when reporters ask the easy questions. Doesn't matter if I've read him, doesn't matter whether I know Darwin was right. Hell, he didn't know if he was right. He was reluctant to publish the conclusions that his evidence led him to. He was a God-fearing man. He did not want to be the author of the theory that turned the religious world, his world, really, upside down. He would just as soon have left Genesis alone he was a God-fearing man. He didn't like where the evidence was pointing. As a lawyer, I can understand that. But he could not deny that the theory he was slowly sketching out was the only one that made sense of the evidence in front of him. Now, I don't know a lot about Mr. Darwin's religion. I, I do know he started out as an Anglican and he studied briefly for the priesthood. And after he developed the theory of evolution, a great spiritual depression came over him, and he took some solace in the Unitarian Church. Sounds like a man who's trying to have it both ways. The truth that he could not deny led him away from the God of his childhood to search for a sense of divinity that was compatible with science. I, I feel for him on that journey. I grew up the son of a one-time Unitarian minister short-time Unitarian minister, actually. My daddy preached to his flock about the compatibility of the Bible and Charles Darwin's writing. He put those two books side by side on top of his pulpit and said, science and faith, my friends, you got to have faith in both of them. And his congregation, who were all three thinkers, agreed with him. And he said, once you got some trust in the way that the world works from those books, you've got to act right in the world. You've got to act consistently. You've got to act ethically. Now what he meant by telling his parishioners that was that you've got to stop all this squabbling that's going on in the pews and in the town. All this holding of grudges about who did what to who five years ago. Just got to get around to forgiving one another. Have a little faith, he said, in human progress, and he put his hand on Darwin. Have a little faith, he said, and he put his hand on the Bible, that love keeps coming into this world from some source, we don't know where, and then live like that was actually true. 
until you have forgiven everybody you should and sought their forgiveness, he said, you haven't really embraced either one of them, science or faith. And his folks listened to that message and were none too happy about it because, as you may know, church people like holding on to their grudges, don't they? <laughs> I like that feeling of being slightly superior to other people. Well, not you folks, of course, but you know church people like that. And they weren't about to let their preacher take those sinful little pleasures away from them. But to my daddy, it was the only conclusion you could reach by reading those books. So he kept preaching it, and eventually, when you preach an unpopular message, your church does what all churches do. They form a committee. <laughs> Committee comes around on Sunday evening to dinner and says, Brother Darrell, we like your scholarship. We admire your piety. But your admonitions are a little wearying and we wish you'd tone it down a bit. But like Darwin, my daddy had seen the truth. He'd seen where the evidence was leading and he couldn't turn away from it. So he left the ministry and he took up his former occupation, which was carpentry. And he delighted in making furniture for his former parishioners. And they liked him a whole lot better then. <laughs> they ordered tables and chairs and cupboards for him. And when he delivered them, he'd still have the same message, forgive one another. And somehow they took it better from the carpenter than they had from the parson. Every now and then, of course, he'd get to make a particularly special piece for one of them. And, uh, well, when he was 80 years old, he said to me, Clarence, it's the, it's the one thing I still need to be forgiven for. We were out, uh, we were out walking in the garden. And he was not a big man, my daddy. He had to stand on a box in the pulpit. And in old age, he had gotten even smaller. So I'd walk along, looking down at him. He'd walk along, kind of looking up at me, almost like a child again. And he'd say, Clarence, I am still so ashamed of it after all these years. He said, that, that perverse pleasure I took more than once in, in putting a final coat of wax on the lid of a coffin for one of my former church members. <laughs> Another thing my daddy told me was science works because scientists know the difference between fact and theory. 